Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Hernia Talk Live, our weekly Q&A with everything you need to know about hernias and um, all the different topics that are hernia related. As many of you know, my name is Dr. Shivin Tofai. I am a hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. You can follow me at, at Hernia Doc on Twitter and Instagram and at Dr. Tofai on Facebook. At the end of this uh, Hernia Talk Q&A session, I will post our link to my YouTube channel where you can watch and share it. And today will be an amazing, amazing session because many of you have asked for Dr. Spy to come on. Um, I have shared some page with Dr. Spy and he is going to be probably one of few surgeons who can really help you um, with your needs. So I'm very, very happy to welcome Dr. Samer Spy. He is a general surgeon and hernia specialist out of New York at Stony Brook. You can follow him at SSBAYE on Twitter. And thank you, Dr. Spy. Hello. Hey, how are you, Shireen? Good. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time. I know uh, it's later in the evening now than it is you know, on my side of the coast, so. <laughs> yeah, the sun is just going down right now, so it's getting dark right outside yeah, now. Yeah, we're a little cloudy, um, but it's been unusually chilly for a spring in California lately, but it's all good. I'm not complaining. Yeah, we're, we're seeing some sun, and finally it's starting to warm up here, so we're very excited. Very good. So many have sent in their questions and it's going to be kind of a busy um a busy hour but maybe we can start first dr spy let me know and let our audience know what your practice looks like and um kind of give a glimpse of why i actually asked to be one of our guests so i run an emergency general surgery service um, which occupies a lot of my time um, but i also have a very busy elective practice um, where I see a lot of hernia patients. Um, and one of the unique things that I do is I do a pure tissue repair, the Scholleiss repair. Um, so I had a good almost two years at the Scholleiss Hospital where I trained and worked uh, before I came back to the U.S. at New York to practice in general surgery. And you're from, are you from uh, Canada? Yeah, Where's I was born, born and raised born. in Toronto. Yeah. Wow. Scholleiss was right in our backyard. Yes, so I visited the Shouldice Hospital back, I want to say maybe 15 years ago. Uh, Mohammed, Dr. Mohammed was there and I got a tour. I got to watch the whole system and watch the operations. It's definitely very different than any hospital or outpatient experience I've ever seen. I loved it, I thought it was really cool. But, um, yeah, so, so the, what they told me, and maybe you can kind of give me a little bit of insight, what they told me was, so you have, let's say, 10 or 12 surgeons that, that uh, offer surgery at the shoulder, is that correct? Apart That's right. And then <clears throat> the, the head doctor, the chief surgeon, randomly scrubs in every so often to kind of audit you to correct. make sure that you don't sway from the traditional teachings of Dr. Shouldice in your technique, because you know surgeons can have a tendency to do that, start making up their own technique. Um, and that's allowed the cl clinic to offer a very steady stream of operations that are very similar from surgeon to surgeon, and therefore it keeps your outcomes very similar too. Does that sound right? Yeah, it's very heavy on routine. Uh, they're heavy on quality control. Uh, in fact, they have, um, what do you call it? They are, um, the, the, the employees that work there, actually, they've been there for several, several years. So, you know, you don't get a turnaround of employees who come and go. Um, some of them have been there for at least 40 years. Yeah. There's a saying, I mean, for surgeons there that all roads end at shoulders. So many of them actually, um, they come in and, and they sort of specialize in hernias when they're sort of slowing down in their practice. But again, they're very heavy on the technique itself, Dr. Scholes himself, his, the son would actually go through the ORs and check on everything and part of the yeah. quality control, the chief of surgery would do the same thing. That's so interesting. 
And then what I what what shocked me was the first time that I saw was surgery being done without an anesthesiologist. Kind of freaked me out. But that's the <laughs> that just shows you like how naive you are as a US surgeon as to what happens elsewhere in the world. And you're highly reliant on local anesthetic. And that thing you guys have with the syringe, I thought was the coolest technique ever. Um, uh, very efficient and works really well. Yeah, I, as you know, Dr. Tofik, it's so refreshing to see a different perspective and to yeah. learn from others. Yeah. So I clearly I went in there with a different perspective, but when I, when I saw how they do it and how they've been doing it for many years, with the results and you know the backlog of patients, it was incredible. They do the most uh, tissue repairs in the world. They do yeah. seven thousand a year. Wow. Um, each surgeon does at least seven hundred a year as well. So I, they're very, you know, it's it's very, it's amazing. It's amazing what they do. So we have a lot of questions related to that. If I, if you don't mind, I'll start going through yeah. some of these questions, and uh, you can help answer them. So, okay, this is a patient said, my surgeon told me he will do the Bastini repair. How is that different than the shoulder dice repair? So there's obviously multiple different types of tissue-based inguinal hernia repairs. Can you just briefly let us know? Yes. So the, the, difference? the highlights, basically, shoulder dice is heavily rooted in, in the Bastini repair. The Bastini mm -hmm. repair is a pure tissue repair. It was actually very popular and effective when it came out, um, but it's a three line layer repair. It was used, uh, it was done using interrupted sutures, which means individual sutures. So you're suturing, tie, suture, tie, suture, tie, and you do three layers. The Scholleis repair, the two differences was that uh, Dr. Scholleis added a fourth line yeah. and he did continuous, which means he took one string and sewed with it two lines and then to, did another one, two lines. And so that's the biggest difference. And he managed to bring down the recurrence rate from over 20% down to 1%. And that's been consistent. They can track back to 1945 to today, exactly what the recurrence rates each year. Now, one thing from the shoulder rights hospital too, is that it's very um, particular about which patients it offers surgery to. So now you've, you've had your training and experience in shoulder rights, you've moved to the United States. We don't, we have a very different patient population. I'm sure that our patient population in general is more obese or more overweight than the Canadian population and so definitely more than what the shoulder dice operates on. So how have you integrated the shoulder dice into your practice, understanding that you now have a population that's different looking? So the success of the Scholleis procedure with regards to recurrence rate and chronic pain rate um, is also important because it's based on weight, weight against your height, which is the BMI. Mm -hmm. If you are a BMI of 29 or less, we can predictively quote to you that your recurrence rate in the right hands, somebody who's trained and has the right volume, that your recurrence rate will be 1% or better. Uh, equally with the chronic pain rate, which is 3%, uh, sorry, 3 in 1,000. This is data that's came, come out of the Scholleis Hospital that they've published. So in my practice now, I've had to adopt the same practice and I tease my patients out. I know exactly who will succeed with a tissue repair and those who don't, I offer mesh repair for them. Yeah, we call that the tailored approach where yeah. you try and do what's best for each individual patient and not treat them like a statistic. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. Another question is, is there anything equivalent to the shoulder dice for umbilical or peri-umbilical or ventral for new repairs? Because I actually read some, some uh, posts on social media and they say, um, I have umbilical hernia repair, I can't do a shoulder dice on me. And we have to explain shoulder dice repair is very specifically a repair of inguinal hernias, either indirect or direct. Um, and there's a modification of it for femoral hernia. So what do you think is a, an equivalent? Is there an equivalent for ventral or? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it, not only did they practice inguinal hernia repairs, but they did also abdominal wall hernias uh -huh. with, require, with the same tailored approach. So if you fit the mold, so to speak, uh, you would be successful with that. And the approach was a sutured repair 
two or three lines or even four lines, depending on the surgeon. But it would be a repair like the Mayo repair, which was sutured. Yes. Um, but it's a uh, horizontal mattress suture and it's running and it's reinforced by a second line. So you're not just sewing tie, sewing tie, but you're running a whole line and then reinforce it with a second line. And that has been very successful. For, according to Dr. Michael Alexander, who's since retired, he's done over 2000 with zero recurrences. Yes, he was great. He was, I, I, I misspoke. Dr. Alexander was the surgeon that I connected with at the shoulders at the time. Um, so that's interesting. Do you think that the multi-layer multi repair in essence, because just to clarify, what kind of suture were they using for uh, the groin? Uh, stainless steel. And what about for the uh, abdomen? Same. Really? Same, and their back, uh, the back fall, they fall back onto a proline. Uh, fall a back onto proline. Yeah. And in your practice, what do you use? I actually, I have had a lot of patients ask me, do you use the same suture? So I managed to find out the distributor and it's actually here in Garden City. So I get stainless steel. It comes on a spool, when, little details. It comes on a spool and you have to bite a needle separately. Yes. So you cut 23 inches, yes. you swedge it onto the needle and you sterilize it. Yeah, well, so in the back room at the shoulder dice, there are women and they're only yes. women that are doing that. They're making individual sutures for the surgeons. I saw that. That was really cool. Yes. Well, I ever, since, I mean, I there's definitely men and women there, but okay, they'll good. also do the same thing for the local anesthetic. Um, they used to use procaine, procainamide, okay. sorry. Yeah. And it would come in these big bottles. They'd measure it out, put it on the scale, uh, mix it, and then sterilize it. But they've moved on to a, a, a virgin at bupivacaine right now. So that's what they're okay. using in IV. Very cool. And then, so my question is, do you think in some ways by doing multiple layers of sutures over and over again, you're kind of mimicking mesh in that you're just making your own quote mesh. I'm using that term very loosely. And so that kind of layered approach is, so the layered approach does two things. It's like doing a diastasis closure over a, a hernia repair. It takes attention off the original repair Exactly. That's the first repair from pulling apart. And that's true for the shoulder too, which is great. Um, but in some ways, I feel that if you're doing a lot, you're actually kind of mimicking the mesh because you're putting in permanent permanent something, either proline or, or steel as like your scaffold, right? You, that's exactly what it is. If you, if okay. you, I, you may, Dr. Alexander may have told you this, but whenever he spoke about it, it's exactly like putting rebar. Yes. Um, and then you, yeah. you're creating the scaffold for the body to actually create the linkages, the collagen uh, fibers and the scar tissue that is actually the glue for the repair. So the stitch is actually just the scaffold. That's all we're doing. Our job is just to put it together. It'll stay there long enough until that collagen falls into place. Right. Another question is for a patient with a small indirect inguinal hernia and a BMI of 27, so overweight but not obese, would the shoulder eye still offer better long term non recurrence than the Bassini? And even mesh by a good surgeon is hard to beat. It's hard to beat 1% recurrence. Is the shoulder dice considered your gold standard? For the right size patient. So again, it's tailored. It has to be tailored. If you go over that, you run the risk of getting a higher recurrence rate. And that's where all the data or success of data out of the Shoalice Hospital is. They haven't really done it on heavier patients from yeah. different size groups. So I, that, that I'm kind of hesitant to move up in the weight, mm -hmm. but certainly I do emergencies as well. So there were circumstances where I could not use mesh. And so yeah. I did a suture technique. But of course, you have to tell a patient, you know, there is a risk for a higher recurrence rate. And uh, BMI of 25 to 30 is considered over, overweight. So would you do a shoulder dice in a BMI of 25 to 30? Yes. I mean, so there's flexibility. Um, and recently there was flexibility at the shoulder dice hospital for a few pounds. Mm -hmm. So according to the chart, it might take you up to 30 or 31 uh, mm -hmm. with the BMI. So, but I, I don't think I have the courage um, to go higher than that for a shoal ice repair. And do you and I, believe, yeah. 
Do you believe the shoulder ice is superior to the Bassini? You know, I don't practice the Bassini. I've done it a handful of times. I mean, my experience and my expertise is in the shoulder ice repair. So in my, yeah. in my hands, it's definitely superior. Okay, yeah, that's a great answer. Um, when I do the tissue repair, sometimes I feel that there's not enough tissue for a shoulder ice. And I feel that uh, a uh, Bassini maybe less, put less tension. Do you think there's any validity to that? Um, it all depends on how it feels. So if you feel like there's tension, there's always an opportunity to do a muscle relaxing incision as well, okay. which would provide you some tissue to bring over as well. Um, but again, there's always an opportunity to use mesh. And I, I found it very important to discuss this upfront with patients. And a lot of them will tell you actually, what happens if you fall into that situation where you might have to use mesh? What do you do? They end up telling me, well, just close me whichever way you think, don't use mesh. Or some will say, okay, use mesh, just fix me right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what do you think about direct versus indirect? So we've had this come up multiple times on hernia talk. Um, most of the tissue repairs are ideal for indirect hernias. The muscle is much more mobile in that region. As you get more medial towards the bone, there's not that much mobility of the muscle. So how do you feel about doing tissue repairs for direct inguinal hernias? Very comfortable. Again, I have to tailor it. But once yeah. you get into the recurrences, that's mm -hmm. where you, you don't get the flexibility and the pliability of the tissue. And that's yeah. where the muscle release is important. And that's where if you, you may have to consider mesh at the same time there. Yeah. Uh, question, does the increased amount of suture material increase the risk of foreign body reaction? Have you seen that? No, I have not. I have not. But, but what I am learning from my patients is that there are many who have environmental allergies. Mm -hmm. So there are elements in the stainless steel um, and their percentages of it. If you look it up, the exact steel that they use at the Shoal Ice Hospital is the same one I use. It's three, mm -hmm. three, uh, sorry, 316L. Uh, look it up. It'll tell you the exact percentage of the elements in it. It could be yeah. nickel. Maybe you're allergic to nickel. It may not fit you. So proline might be a good option for you. Does it have nickel? It does. Oh, okay. Uh, it's like in the single digits. Yeah, you know, I had a patient who had something called um, pelvic congestion syndrome. So that's uh, one uncommon reason for pelvic pain. And the treatment for that is, is to basically cut out the ovarian vein or destroy the ovarian vein as part of the feeding this kind of varicose veins situation in the pelvis. So she had coils of the of this, but there are different types of brands of coils. Unfortunately, this brand of coil had nickel in it and she had a pretty bad nickel allergy. So she didn't know. So she had both ovarian veins coiled and it basically gave her like a burn of her retroperitoneum yeah. and very severe pain, didn't go away. And we went in and surgically excised the ovarian vein on both sides and that cured her. But, you know, you just don't know sometimes um, when you put implants, even things like coils that the interventional radiologist did, if you have side effects from it. Well, we learn a lot from our patients. I have patients who request samples and we send the samples out to them and they test them. Yeah. <clears throat> I had a patient last week who came in with a 20 page study out of a chemical area that actually tested stuff for everything. Yes. Um, I recently had somebody who was allergic to manganese. There's a small percentage of manganese wow. in uh, steel and she just, her pain would not go away. And we ended up removing the steel yes. and replacing it with proline. And thankfully she's doing a bit better now. Yeah. But I have a lot of patients that I see for mesh reactions. Um, uh, Asia syndrome is another term used for it. And it's basically a reaction to the implant and it's a systemic autoimmune or inflammatory reaction. And I've had two that had reactions to actual suture to the point where I had to go in and remove the suture and use um, absorbable suture in them. Or I have put the suture, I just removed it and just let everything else stay. And they haven't had a recurrence since, but it was since. But I try and push the surgery as far out from the original surgery as possible to kind of encourage 
the patient's own healing, but that yeah, is it happens. That's important. Yeah. The Vicryl, the antibacterial Vicryl is got something called, and I think it's tensile and I had to use chromic cat gut instead. So wow. I, you know, it's that I totally taught me something new, this patient. Um, and then how far out should you operate on somebody who has a recurrence? They have a Shoalice hospital has a strict guide there. You don't operate on anybody unless it's after 12 months. Oh, wow. Yeah. Until everything settles down. And of course, as you know, I mean, at being at the academic centers, sometimes you can't wait that long just because people present with a lot more symptoms. So I, I mean, yeah. it's a tough decision. You want to do the right thing for your patient. I think that 12 month number came because the studies show that as you look at patients with chronic pain, the numbers decrease at the farther out you go. So many of those people that present with chronic pain, which by definition was any pain or symptoms after three months, right. they got better and almost cured by 12 months. But I mean, if you have a meshoma or like a hernia recurrence, that pain's not going to go away in 12 months. So I think you need to kind of understand how to specifically evaluate patients to uh, and not have like a blanket thing. Okay, another question about BMI. What is your opinion about the Marcy um, repair uh, for males and females? And then um, this is a 30-year-old healthy male with a low BMI, 21 or 22, that's calling. So the I, Marcy repair is also multiple suture layer repair. I, I have not done any of that. So I, I, don't, I am not a person to comment yeah. on that, unfortunately. Yeah, there's, I have a book and there's like a hundred different tissue repairs. <laughs> Everything has a little tweak. It's like uh, buying a shirt or tennis shoes. There's like a million different ways. They all have the same function. So Mark, there's a, we, yeah. Come, or there's a Dr. Abraham in Israel, actually, who's done, I think, done quite a bit of this on his patients, mm -hmm. um, fertile females where they had um, uh, umbilical hernias. And there's always yeah. a question in our you know, uh, communities about when to operate on a female who's sort of planning to conceive. But yeah. I think if, if you look him up, you might find some stuff on him that he's actually written quite a bit on it. Yes. So for inguinal hernia is a Marcy repair, just a simple closure of the internal ring. Um, it's not considered standard for males. Uh, it is considered appropriate for females with small inguinal hernias. And so that's kind of my answer for your question there. Excellent. Next question is, if I were scheduled for an open non-mesh hernia repair, inguinal hernia repair, just on one side, and my surgeon suspects I may also have a similar hernia on the other side, um, what would you recommend I do and what questions should I ask them? That's a good question. Very good question. So I, you know, it depends on what they're doing. If they're doing a laparoscopic mm -hmm. approach, they have the unique uh, luxury of actually seeing both sides and addressing both sides through the same incisions. If they're doing an open, you're going to require another incision. Yeah, that's the downside with the open is you only have an, uh, you can only see what you're looking at and can't see elsewhere. That's correct. So I will answer this as if you have a hernia that it has that's symptomatic, so you, ha you have pain from it, or you have any symptoms where people think it's from a hernia, and it's on both sides, then a laparoscopic approach is the best approach because you can treat both sides. Um, if you don't want a laparoscopic approach or don't want mesh, only want to open repair without mesh, then you're stuck with just one side. Uh, and I would use imaging to confirm if you have a hernia on either side, it would be inappropriate to make a scar just to look and see if you, uh, okay. if you have a hernia. Yeah, so imaging would be number one. And then if you have no symptoms and they just happen to find a hernia on the other side, there's no urgency to repair that side if you have no symptoms. Um, okay, well, someone just says, good evening. I'm glad that you have this talk. I'm right now finally getting some answers. I'm from Bend, Oregon and finally got my diagnosis from two different doctors in New York. So I think that's great. More thank yous for the great discussion. What is the difference between proline and ethicon suture and also orthocord? I haven't heard of orthocord. That maybe is an orthopedic thing. Is that a, is orthocord a cotton? I'm telling you, we learn so much from our patients. These are such good questions. <laughs> Don't you love it? My patients are the best. The heart attack patients, they're respectful, they're lovely, and they're so knowledgeable. Okay, so ortho code, sorry, ortho 
chord um, is part PDS monofilament and part something else. That's interesting. It's it's PDS looks like. PDS so, absorbable. Yeah, PD, so PDS, it's a great suture. It's technically absorbable suture. Oh, it's a combination of PDS and I think wire. Yeah, it's wire plus PDS. That's interesting. Why would you do that? Unique proprietary material provides a supple solution for soft tissue while we retain the strength and not security in or okay, in orthopedic. So okay, so orthocord is wire, which is what orthopedic surgeons often use, but they integrated absorbable suture in it to reduce how much total wire you need. So you get early tensile strength, but less overall suture at the end. We don't use orthocord by definition, it's orthopedic. <laughs> um, okay, difference between proline and ethicon. Would you like to answer that? Uh, proline and ethicon? Or I guess it should be at the bond. And, and ethabond. Yeah. So I think ethabond is more, um, I'm, I'm at a loss of words. Braided. But, ethabond is braided. Polyester. Yeah, it's braided. So, uh, okay. So the difference between braided probably and monofilament. Yeah. Um, so interesting story with uh, shoal ice repairs. They used yeah. to use permanent stitch always. So they started out with silk, which was a braided suture. Yes. And that created some uh, infected sinuses. So I, I think, unfortunately, I think the braided, I don't know, I may be at risk at that, but that's what a braided is. Mm -hmm. Monofilament is more slippery, and I think it creates less reaction to the tissues as well. Right. Yeah, and then one's polypropylene, one's polyester. Um, in my practice, I would say that the beauty of the braided polyester is it's very soft. So if it's a thin patient and you want it kind of close to the skin, like a belly button hernia, I tend to use the ethabond. Uh, ethab Did I say ethabond? Um, ethabond because you don't feel the tips that you cut. Um, but proline, like you said, it's also permanent, but it's monofilament. It's more like uh, fishing wire. So it's it, if it's nice and flat, it goes to the tissue much nicer, less risk of infection. Um, but we have various options for permanent tissue surgery. Okay. Oh, this one I have. Okay, here's another question. At the shoulder ice clinic, here, I'm gonna show this to you real quick. At the shoulder ice clinic, they told me they will cut my cremasteric muscle. Why is that? And do you cut the cremasteric muscle? Very good question. They cut the chromosteric muscle, yes, and they found that it actually decreases recurrence rates. Um, but the downside of that is that you lose your chromosteric reflex, which means if you jump into the lake, your testicles don't sh move up into your body uh, into the cold water. Um, but there's also most of the time you'll have a nerve that runs in the chromosteric muscle, which is called the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. Yeah. Um, so it's going to transect that. And from my experience and the show lights experience, you'd think you're going to lose some sensation. You're absolutely right. You're going to lose sensation temporarily. Um, you'll be numb there. But we found that somewhere between six months and 24 months, everybody gets their sensation back. And oh, there's, okay. no loss, there's no loss of motor function. Very important question as well. Everybody wants yeah. that. So, does, so the testicle doesn't completely drop. Uh, the scrotum doesn't completely drop. No, there are it's tissues just, that are closer to the testicle that will hold it up there. So it's yeah. not just the cremasteric. That's just, I think it's mostly just for the re reflex. And they, and though they cut the cremasteric muscle, they do hitch it up against the pubic bone, it, right? It is, it is reattached to the closure of the external oblique at the end. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. And the proximal one, the one that's closer to where the cord uh, drops into the belly. Yeah. That one swung across around the uh, the spermatic cord like a scarf. Yeah. And that's the beginning of the re recreation of that deep ring. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Try okay. not to be too technical. <laughs> 
you know some of the questions that are asked I, I really love I mean look at all these cremasteric muscle questions um, okay this patient had an open inguinal hernia pair with a plug-in patch for a direct hernia so that's a type of mesh I now have chronic testicular pain unchanged from prior to surgery many surgeons do not no, many surgeons want to do mesh removal, triple neurectomy, and laparoscopic mesh repair of the recurrent hernia. Why can't I just have a tissue repair? So I get these patients as well. Yeah. They come specifically for tissue repair. And again, my selection criteria is the same. It's got to be tailored, and it's according to the weight. So if you fit the BMI, I'm happy to do it. Um, these tend to have a lot of scar tissue. It's technically challenging. Uh, to remove the mesh and release the spermatic cord as well. Um, yeah. There is some success actually in repairing it using the shoal ice repair. But again, the key is sort of properly releasing the tissues there. Um, and again, the yeah. triple neurectomy is important because you're suffering from chronic pain. So you need somebody who knows where these nerves are and to address them properly. Laparoscopic is a good option as well. I mean, there, Dr. Chen, I believe he has, he had a great talk about doing the triple neurectomy yeah. Um, within the belly and just following the nerve up there and clipping them there. Yeah. But I, I would definitely do a triple neurectomy when I do this. So I'm more on the selective neurectomy. Um, so I, I started doing laparoscopic triple neurectomy. That's, uh, we were the second, I think it was first discussed, I think in Belgium, maybe like 10 years prior, no one really did much of it. And then we were the first to present our data and technique yeah. and at stages um and i stopped doing it and i'll tell you why the laparoscopic triple neurectomy and i discussed it with dr Amin. he's like you should call it the radical neurectomy because you basically cut the entire length of the nerve um it's pretty radical and the reason why i say that is we don't know this and i've looked at every single anatomy book since then there's no anatomy book that tells you that the ilioinguinal or iliohepatogastric nerve has any motor nerve fibers but it does right. mm -hmm. and it does as it comes off the the spine before it pierces the um, lateral abdominal wall to, to come to the front of the muscle the anterior abdominal wall there's a lot of muscle fibers motor fibers that it releases so in some patients if you do this laparoscopic triple neurectomy you're actually denervating that abdominal wall and you get this asymmetric bulging of that side. Mm -hmm. It's, I think, a horrible complication. Um, there's nothing you can do about it unless you do some like very radical kind of plication surgery. Um, it doesn't get better. And it's just not a pleasant way to do this. Subsequent to our experience, Dr. Chen presented at the Pacific Coast Surgical Association um his much larger series and i approached him after the after his presentation i said you know i've been experiencing these denervation problems um you didn't mention it in your study and the, pa the paper got published and he said i asked him if he sees it he's like yeah i see it but they get better and that has not been my experience um Interesting. and i'm a huge like not advocate of triple neurectomy the reason why triple neurectomy became popular was with Dr. Amid. He had patient after patient after patient, like this gentleman that had a plug and patch repair, that had chronic pain. And he found, he looked at his data, triple neurectomy versus not triple neurectomy. And he found that the patients that had triple neurectomy had better chronic pain, um, uh, better, uh, it better addressed their chronic pain. However, I'm the skeptic. I think the reason why the triple neurectomy patients got better relief than the non triple neurectomy is, you know, if you cut everyone, if you cut everyone at, how should I say this? If everyone's nerve gets cut, then everyone's going to have the quote pain free. Of course, it's not a, it's not a, um, procedure without risk. There's risk for neuroma and all that. But whereas if you try and be a little bit more sophisticated and figure out which nerves you need to cut and don't cut the nerves that you don't need, you, they're not involved, then 
potentially you're saving some people from denervation and some people from neuroma risks. So I spend a little bit more extra time to try and figure out what nerves need to be addressed. And I try very hard not to do anything laparoscopically with regard to direct. And if, if I do, then I get the nerve way as distal as I can laparoscopically right. to really that, minimize the motor motor. Uh, that's so of it. interesting. I because yeah. that makes me feel better because I do it on the anterior abdominal wall in the open approach. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and and in our experience at the Shoalice Hospital has always that I, I'm afraid to say 100 percent but I definitely the majority have gotten their sensation back, but have not appreciated this, you know, asymmetric bulging uh, of the abdominal wall. But again, something has to be said about, you know, being a little bit sophisticated about the way you look at patients. Yeah. They are human beings. You have to consider all their symptoms that they come with. You have to listen carefully to what they're saying, because there's a lot in there to be said about which way to approach them. So, you know, Dr. Bruce Ramshaw, he was one of my first uh, set of guests uh, on Hernia Talk Live. And I'll tell you, the, um, it's great talking to him every time because he really understands how every patient's different and we're not God and we don't understand everything. Yeah. And we talked about, um, you know, triple neurectomy and, and uh, selective neurectomy. And what he was saying was that our, and he's very right, because I've experienced it. Medical practice, especially in the United States, um, is very volume oriented. The more patients you see, the more money you make. The more patients you see, the happier your hospital is with you, the more likely you are to um, keep your job. <laughs> Basically, a lot of surgeons are treated based on volume, right? Yep. Um, and RV, which is basically um, work units that are assigned. So if you do like a brain surgery, that work unit is more than a hernia surgery. So because of that, you don't have the time to sit down with patients with chronic pain and really figure out which nerve, what symptoms, how is it exacerbated, do a nerve block, see how that responds. That takes a lot of time and energy back and forth with patients. Um, and when my practice got busy, I saw that I couldn't do that anymore. I couldn't be in a system that promoted volume when I'm seeing more and more chronic pain patients. Now I have the luxury of sitting for an hour or more and calling patients and following through with things, which I couldn't do in the prior system. And I think the problem is there's very few of us that do that. Uh, most patients fall in the crack of institutions that have very well-meaning, very talented surgeons, but they just don't have, you know, if you have 10 or 15 minutes to see a, a consult, there's no way you can really appropriately oh, treat difficult. a chronic pain patient. So that's everyone difficult. gets a triple neurectomy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like yeah, I, I, I think I'd bet. I, I completely hear what you're saying. I, I, I enjoy hearing that it has to be a sophisticated approach. And I think I'm totally for that. But I, again, when you're dealing with a recurrent and a recurrent and maybe a triple recurrent, yeah. you know, the chances are that the, that the nerves are really intact there. Yeah, probably totally not. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, as you're cleaning up the tissue, developing your planes so that you can sew things together, yeah. I, I, it's, it's a tough decision to make, but um, like you said, there's few people who actually take the time to sit and listen to these patients because yeah. they may be bouncing from one, one surgeon to the next. Yeah. Yeah. And they really do need that. And I feel that instead of the, sur the patients, instead of going from cert, like see five surgeons all within their network with a $20 copay, um, none of whom can help them. Sometimes right. you have to kind of save your money, grow the one surgeon who will give you the time and effort and get you to the point that you need to go to. Um, it's a, just a different way of thinking about medicine and in the US, our medical system is not meant to kind of encourage that. I agree. Um, so going back to this patient, they want to do a mesh removal, triple neurectomy, laparoscopic mesh repair. So your, your answer was, yes, absolutely. This patient can have the plug and patch removed if that's the cause of their pain and get a tissue repair. I just did one last week. <laughs> That's a great answer. It, it is not 
um, it's not a pleasant procedure. It's very scarred in. Yeah. Um, and, and it's, um, you have to really appreciate the tissues that are running through that space mm -hmm. and try to preserve them as much as possible. Uh, the mesh is definitely the cause of this when people, when, when I see these patients, everything's pretty much socked into the mesh. And that's not a setup yeah. for, you know, for anything that's good. So it effort has to be taken to remove the mesh. Um, and then, like I said, I, I, in my experience, even if I say I'm going to do a triple anarchomy, I do look for those nerves. Yes. How many times have I found the ilioinguinal nerve <laughs> intact? Yeah. Especially in a recurrence and the, uh, you might see some uh, leftover chromasterics. I definitely take that because I know the genital femoral nerve is the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve is running through there, yeah. and usually the iliohypogastric will dip into the um, the conjoined tendon or the triple layer there. Sometimes yeah. you might see it, and sometimes you may not. But if you go far medially, you actually could probably find it. Yes. 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 My and, answer is triple nerectomy in these recurrence and, recurrences. And do you have any problem doing tissue repair after mesh removal? You know, it could get a little bit dicey after the second or third recurrence. So those those are talks that I have up front, and I say, listen, I might have to do a a mesh repair again. You have to take into consideration. You got to do probably a muscle release as well. Yeah. Um, just to encourage it, but it can be done. I have done it here. Yeah. So I, I think these are very pleasant operations. I find mesh removal very satisfying, especially the plugs. And depending on the reason why the patient has symptoms, you sometimes only need to remove the plug, which you can do laparoscopically or robotically and not have to address the only patch part of it. Um, that's where kind of the, the tailored approach comes into play. Yeah. And that way you don't have to address any of the nerves, especially if they don't have any true nerve problems. I tell the patient the process of Removing mesh alone may injure nerves. And that's why you may need a neurectomy um, for that process. And then, so if you don't have nerve, if this is, how do I explain this? If this is an isolated testicular pain due to the plug, then shaving the plug off of the, the testicle, the spermatic cord alone, should do it. You may not even need another hernia repair if you have your only patch still in place. So the short answer is there's a lot of options, open, laparoscopic, robotic, partial mesh removal, full mesh removal, neurectomy, no neurectomy. It all depends on the, everything else in that kind of. I found many of these patients are so knowledgeable. They come in yeah. prepared, having read a lot. Yes. So be ready to have a good discussion. Yes. Yeah. All right, next question. I had an abdominal repair in 2018 and hip surgery in 2020, but I have some nerve pain and pubic symphysis pain that doesn't want to go away. So abdominal repair, 2018. Um, all problems that started from an injury in December, 2016. I don't understand why there's nerve pain from the abdominal repair. Um, Maybe the rectus. Okay, I don't know what the, if you want to give me more details on that. Uh, we'll try to answer that, but I don't understand the question because an abdominal repair doesn't mean anything. Does that mean the ingual repair, abdominal approach, or an abdominal wall hernia repair? All right, next question. If I were a healthy patient who didn't want polypropylene mesh, could I request a biological or absorbable mesh so that I could still get this laparoscopically, even though it's normally used in patients such as with infections? Do you ever use biologics? No, not in laparoscopic, but it is, there's a lot more data coming out about the recurrence rates with them and they seem to be improving, but the, the numbers, the volume that they're reporting about is not very high, yeah. uh, but they're thicker. I think they're thicker meshes um, and that's why they may do a little bit better. They're not thin. I don't know what your experience was. Yeah. So I was part of that initial wave of biologics okay. being the best thing in the world. Interesting. <laughs> Early two oh, thousands. Cool. Well, I'm yeah. so glad I'm talking to you. I was using it like water and I was at the County at USC, which is a huge burn center. So they already had biologic tissue for skin, a skin um, replacement. And so we had a very cheap contract with uh, the biologic companies. So they were okay with me using these very otherwise very expensive biologic meshes. And I dealt with a lot of mesh infections and so on. So 
we learned a lot. We learned that you can't use biologic mesh it's similar to synthetic mesh. First of all, it's completely absorbable. So you, you really wanna use it to buttress a good tissue repair. So that's one way of doing it. And then I really have minimized how much I use biologic mesh. It's close to zero right now, unless if there's a infection in the area. Do you have the right to request it? Yes, is a surgeon able to use it if they choose to, even though it's not indicated? Yes. Um, what, do you know anything about hybrid meshes? I'm becoming a big fan of hybrid meshes. Like yeah, Ovatex. Um, uh, Ovatex yeah. is actually, it's, it's sheep and I think it's, uh, it's, it's biologic. Yeah. Ovatex? Yeah. Ovatex is biologic. They have two types of Ovatex. They have I, the permanent and the absorbable. Too. Huh? I used that last week too to bridge on a, an emergency general surgery patient. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah. it's an absorbable biologic, similar to yes. Stratus, Flex HD, et cetera, but it's, it's sheep stomach. But they also have a permanent version. So instead of having uh, sutures through it that are absorbable, they have polypropylene sutures through it, 4 polypropylene uh, okay. um, that sutures it through. That's so the scaffold. That's the scaffold. So it's like 4% synthetic, 96% absorbable. Um, and I feel it has the best of both worlds. So it's, it acts like a biologic and it's low in inflammatory potential, low risk for reaction and for body reaction and for body cessation. But it still has enough synthetic to help reduce your risk of hernia recurrence. Yeah, I've, 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 had, I've had a lot of questions about doing the tissue repair using biologic, by, but by, you know, in the emergency general surgery world, I use a lot of mesh. I use Phasix, which is a uh, biosynthetic, and I use Ovatex as well. That's where my experience is. But I, I don't, I don't, I've never really used it to buttress a, uh, a tissue repair. Yeah, I had a patient who was a like, not professional, but very prolific kind of a soccer player. And he needed mesh removal. He didn't want mesh put back in him, but he had a very large direct hernia. So I did a tissue repair on him and I said, let me put some biologic as a buttress. Because mm -hmm. I don't want you, if I don't want you to bust open this tissue repair. Um, and he did very well. Excellent. So, I don't know. What did you use? Do you um know? I want to say Flex HD. Okay, good. Yeah. Good to know. Okay, next question. Um, let's see. Okay, someone says you're right about the information with this US system of healthcare. It's better to save and go to a specialist that will have more time. Yep. I totally agree. Completely. Okay. Um, what's the best way to diagnose general femoral nerve entrapment? It's a random question. <laughs> I mean, entrapment imply there's you can't tell if it's entrapped until you look at it, but you can tell if you have nerve neuralgia, like nerve pain, right? Um, so I've had an experience with an ilioinguinal nerve that was entrapped, and that is painful. Yeah. It follows the exact pathway of where it's supposed to go. Yes, exactly. So again, if you do, yeah, if you do, if you know your anatomy, you pretty much know which nerve is involved so you can address it. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, can you please ask what steps and or protocols you recommend to reduce surgical site infection? Options include chlorhexine shower the night before or morning of surgery, nasal antiseptics for decolonization of bacteria, warming the patient in the holding area, clipping hair um, instead of shaving, uh, redosing of antibiotics using antiseptic coated sutures and using wound borders. Those are all great. Yeah. That's all a very above. thorough, that's very Thank thorough. You. Thank you for answering the question. <laughs> I, um, I think the antiseptic, the triclosan antiseptic coated sutures have not been shown to be of value, but okay. everything else, yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, also, um, controlled your blood sugars, uh, and you know, prefer that you're not obese. Yeah. 
That's and you're not smoking. And not smoking Nic nicotine though, right? Yes. Marijuana's okay. I don't know. <laughs> I think I think that's you're you're thing. absolutely. No, I'm joking. It's yeah, definitely nicotine is the issue. I'm calling yeah. you from California. I'm telling you, marijuana seems to be okay for wound healing. It's the nicotine. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Some people. Do you measure? Uh, do you actually? Is that a strict protocol for you? Do you check for nicotine and do you measure it? Uh, for complex surgery, surgery, yeah. 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 And for everything else, I encourage that they reduce it. Like, but. Uh, I'm not as a strict on it for like inguinal hernias. Okay. Yeah. Going back to the gentleman with the uh, testicular pain, what are the causes of testicular pain that are not due to the testicle? And I think this is kind of in relation to having had a mesh. So hernias can cause testicular pain and mesh injury can cause testicular pain. What are your thoughts on those? So I, interesting, Dr. Ben David, before he passed last year, he actually put out a couple of papers. He would actually get transplanted or explanted mesh from California, yes. examine it in, uh, in, at the University of Toronto. And they found that usually somewhere between four and seven years, there's some migration of the mesh into these, these tissues, like the cord. Yeah. So I, I you the know, they, yeah, yeah, into the nerves. They wrote about that. So, I mean, that, I, I think that really happens, but for testicular pain, you have to consider, um, you know, the indirect hernias, the direct hernias, which can cause pressure there onto the cord. Um, and then they can actually squeeze uh, whatever's in that cord. I mean, you've got your vas deferens, which is your channel for sperm. Mm -hmm. You've got the vessels as well, and you've got some nerves in there as well. So those can all be affected by hernias or by the mesh that's migrated into that. So testicular pain from indirect inguinal hernias can occur. This gentleman had a direct inguinal hernia. So a direct inguinal hernia, assuming you were correctly diagnosed and you, they didn't miss an indirect inguinal hernia, assuming that was correctly diagnosed, uh, a direct hernia should not give testicular pain. It's the indirect inguinal hernias that cause testicular pain. Repair that should resolve the testicular pain you can get a different type of testicular pain if the mesh is now causing the pain. So that's kind of where I would, I would say there's plenty of other reasons for testicular pain. We've had two urologists on where we discussed this. I highly recommend you go to the, go to my YouTube channel, look at the episode we had with Dr. Paul Turek about testicular pain. We completely discussed spermatocele, varicocele, hydrocele, um, uh, epididymitis, uh, orchitis, spermato or spermato epididymal or orchitis, um, vasal, uh, what's that one? Vasitis, which is, or vasitis, which is inflammation and almost like an autoimmune of your vas. There's plenty of little things that can cause testicular pain. And you really need to go to a surgeon like Dr. Paul Turak, who specializes only in, um, sexual function and fertility in men because they do a lot of testicular pain um or cups so that's i hope that's helpful for you we had a great hour with him okay we're getting very close to our hour can you believe that already amazing i know but more questions to come they just keep coming um i had an open right angle reconstruction and right adductor tenotomy but the burning but I have burning pain in the inguinal hernia, in the inguinal area. Yeah, see, these are difficult questions because burning pain can mean a lot of things. Is it labial? Is it inner thigh? Is it wraparound? Is it activity related? Um, these are where you really need to see a specialist. Now, how do patients come to see you, Samer? Um, so that sounds like a sports hernia repair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they did a tenotomy as well. Yeah. Um, so I've started to see some of these things and you have to know, you have to do a, comp, a comprehensive workup up there and make sure you rule out other stuff. Yeah. Um, but I, again, like you said, I, you have to find out exactly more information about what's going on with what's the burning from, where is it happening mm -hmm. to better um, identify exactly where the issue is and sort of investigate. I, like, I, I don't hesitate to investigate with imaging if I need to. Yes. To, to find out exactly what's going on. You might be surprised. You might find a reason for it with the imaging. Yeah, it looks like they found um, 
a torn external oblique fibers near the internal ring that was repaired. And then for some reason, they'd sacrifice the ilioinguinal nerve. You don't need to do that if you have a fascial tear, you just fix the tear and then the, the nerve pain goes away. And then we're, we published our, or we're publishing our data, but we presented it at, um, we'll be presenting it at stages as a podium presentation on, you know, the downfalls of neurectomy. And we showed a 4%, and I think nationally there's like a 5% neuroma or recurrent neuralgia pain. Um, so for example, since you got your ilioingual nerve cut, uh, like I said, these, every decision that is made has pros and cons. And so neurectomy cons include potential for neuroma and, and more burning pain. So it's possible that your pain is now from this neurectomy. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, you just need a surgeon to kind of sit down and figure it out and, and like maybe get nerve block. Do you do nerve blocks in your office or ultrasound or anything like that? I do, I do trigger yeah. injections. Yeah. Uh, but again, I, I don't hesitate to enlist the help of colleagues such as a pain specialist um, and sort of um, who can assist me with some, some of the chronic pain issues. Yes, yes. So you were saying, uh, I assume you see patients both locally and from all around the world. Do you do virtual consultations with them? I, I did a whole afternoon this afternoon. <laughs> you look so fresh though. <laughs> it's the lighting. <laughs> you know you know what it's like at the academic center. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. But this is a great way to end my day. This is the yes. best way. Oh. Well, this could be your life. This could I, be it. I, I am in. We'll be talking. <laughs> Very good. Um, they you call your office. You have a website. Um do they can they just Tweet so they can, you can, Twitter can account. Twitter, they can get me on my Twitter handle. You can actually Google my name and profile. You'll see a complete academic profile there. There's a hyperlink for show lice repair. Yes. At the end of that, there's a form that you can fill out PDF and just send it, fax it over to us. That's great. Uh, yeah. And you offer laparoscopic robotic open. Um, we part of the division offers all of that. I I'm getting into robotic right now just because of the complex ventral hernias. Yes. Uh, but the bulk of my practice now has been this tissue repair, just because it's 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 a lot. I mean, my my clinic has turned into this basically. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because there's a demand. There's so many patients that we all need to help. And I'm happy to see the complicated ones and sort of sit down and figure it out. I mean, if I don't have the answer. I'm sure I'll find somebody who may have a better answer than I do. And that's the how, one we're trying to help them out. How far is Stony Brook from uh, New York City? Uh, it's about an hour and 20 minutes. By car? Yes. Okay. And good. train. Yeah. They can fly in. Yep. Yeah, we get people fly into LaGuardia or JFK, or we have uh, Islip here, which is an airport. It's about a 20 minute drive. Great. Well, thanks for your time. This was fun. Thank you, Dr. Tofik. This I has been. It. A pleasure. Thank you Thank so you. much. Hope to see you again soon, maybe at a conference. I don't know if you'll be at Las Vegas. Say you'll be at Sages in Las Vegas. I'm going to try and get there. I know. Yeah, we'll catch up then. then. Thank you so much. All right. So it's lovely to see you. Thank you. We're going to say goodbye. Thanks, everyone, for joining me. Um, as you know, we'll be here again next week doing another episode of Hernia Talk live. Uh, many of you are already on herniatalk.com. And so on that note, I'm going to say goodbye. Uh, watch me on my social media accounts uh, for the link to the YouTube uh, video for this hour. And I'll see you all next week. And thank you, Samer. Have a good Love night. To talk to you. Take thank care. you guys. Bye. Bye.